Good afternoon, everybody. Happy hump day under quarantine. Uh, this is Chris Snook. We're going to dive right in. Appreciate you as you log on. Just give me a little hello in the chat. Let me know that you're here um, if you feel so inclined and that you can hear me okay. We're going to be talking about the future of events and how it is better than you may think. Some of you may already believe that. We'll also talk about where it's not going to be better because there's plenty of places where it's not going to be better. Again, this is presented by Smarter B2B in partnership with and brought to you by Emerge. So we'll get the commercial out of the way up front <clears throat> so we can dive right into the business. These wouldn't be possible without our friends at Emerge. Um, make sure you uh, mention Decisions 2020, which kicked off this weekly executive briefing series. We've covered all kinds of content over the last several weeks. encourage you to look that up on, on uh, YouTube. Uh, you can find it on my channel, um, and uh, also you'll be able to find it soon on the new Emerge.com website underneath webinars. I don't believe that's live yet, but if you're looking for an AI uh, independent platform that takes a lot of the sunk costs out of B2B relationship uh, building with targeted qualified prospects um, and gets you back to prospecting uh, with relationships belly to belly in a non-belly to belly world, then uh, I encourage you to call Cameron up over at Emerged and have a complimentary list of 2,000 customized targets built to see if there's any potential fit for working together. Anyway, thank you, Emerged. Back to business. Uh, I'm, one of my favorite topics today because um, if I've done anything uh, in the last seven years, it's been events and um, speaking and done a lot of different things. But um, this topic is near and dear to my heart because it fundamentally impacts my own future. And uh, like many of you, maybe you've seen revenues go off of a cliff if you're listening to this and you uh, either rely on events for your sales channel or whether you produce events or speak at events um, the last couple of months and maybe even six months prior to that was a little tenuous to say the least. And over the last six weeks, you've probably had a lot of surprises. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. Uh, you can look up some of these on the link if you're curious what we've been involved in. I'm going to take the lens today because it's the smarter B2B audience as well as because uh, I don't like talking about things I don't know. Um, I'd much rather talk about the things that I can uh, and do know and, and that I'm working on. Most of this is going to be related to B2B marketers, B2B event producers. Um, some of this is going to be relevant to you if you're dealing with end users or entertainment kind of things. I think you'll be able to extrapolate uh, from these trends, but understand that the majority of this is for event planners, uh, conference attendees, sponsors of those kind of things brands looking to uh, maintain or sustain or maybe even create a competitive advantage moving forward with uh, the, the world of live events, whether they be virtual, in-person, or hybrid in a post-pandemic world. So you can chat with me. You can send me emails offline. Um, you can participate in the polls. All those things help me contextualize the next 20 minutes for you uh, more effectively. So I encourage you to take advantage of those. If you've got questions, you can submit them to me privately or in the everyone chat. Either way works perfectly. <clears throat> We're going to talk about some forces, the related impacts, what I think uh, the various futures of events could look like, and then some resources and, and some source material so that you can dig deeper on the things that interest you. <clears throat> Pretty horrific uh, from a revenue standpoint. But we had over a billion and a half attendees from 180 countries um, attend B2B type events in 2018, over $1 trillion in direct spending. So that's spending that is related to what it takes to produce an event, get to an event, um, be a sponsor of or exhibit 195 that exist, had 96% of the global revenue for industry events. Um, obviously with North America, European Union, Asia, <clears throat> taking up most of that revenue. And so um, 700 to 1300 bucks, call it, is, is roughly what the average per participant revenue per event was in 2018. Um, probably mirrored that in 2019, maybe a little bit of an uptick there. Uh, the impacts, though. So what kind of event, uh, what do events have as far as an impact on the overall economy? Um, Two and a half trillion dollars plus in business sales comes off of the backs of B2B type events. That's a significant portion of um, company growth and revenue. 26 million jobs are maintained or sustained because of the existence of a live event industry. And this sector generates more sales. This was a shocking one to me until I saw the stat. <clears throat> and the link uh, where you can learn more about this and get some links to the full articles and full reports is, is right below. 
uh, for, for those who want to jot that down or, or the slide share, uh, we'll have it and you can copy and paste it. Business events sector directly generated more input or I'm sorry, more output than many other large sectors, inc including consumer electronics and office equipment. So when you think about um, how important the event industry is, um, it's very important. And you know, we don't know exactly when we'll travel again, but everyone's asking the question. Uh, what we do know is that human beings are gonna always wanna meet in person to some degree. And I also believe, and this is the bias you need to understand coming in, that both on my own personal vantage point, my own conversations, and also the research we've done, but just gut level, um, we're not going to do things inefficiently anymore when we've discovered by force of this pandemic how to do them more efficiently. We're going to be much more choosy. So the day of peak event where everybody could fill a room and everything was probably over in 2019 anyway. Uh, I certainly saw that in the sectors that we're in. Um, and, you know, good always uh, matters, but more than ever, good enough will not be good enough. And so... Um, that's kind of our setup. So what are the priorities? The, the priorities are obviously shifting. <clears throat> I think not, not jokingly, but somewhat jokingly, just to set the stage for you know, today's conversation, most of the event planners, event organizers, sponsor um, organizations, different things like that right now, they're just focused on survival. Um, PPP just got reapproved in the United States for a second round of stimulus. Most companies that are small businesses or, or fall into this category of event and, and agencies and organizers, things like that, have not received any word yet on their loans, at least most of the ones that I know that have applied. So survival is top of mind. But as we've done that, we've all been home more. I'm sure I'm not alone in this. We've also been experimenting. We've also been doing things. We've been beyond Zooming, right? And, and so what's beautiful about this and, and what we're going to talk about a little bit today is some of the things that hopefully will just continue to spur innovation. Most of us have not innovated. This industry has not been innovated in for quite some time. Um, you know, there, there hasn't been any fundamental shifts in, in how we gather people in, in the, the frameworks of which we do that, the, the different experiences. Now, there's been some awesome different things that have happened in the, in the um, wings or on the sideline or augmentating our core value. But we're forced to fundamentally reinvent the business model now um, for events. And that is starting to show some positive signs already. As, as I just see what people are doing uh, in the way of, of online stuff and, and now thinking about it more strategically as, as part of a ongoing concern. So these are dated, but they still are relevant because I think it sets up the table for where there's going to be um, a shift in priorities, but where some of these priorities will remain. So budgets are always number one as of 2018, almost 82% of people had that as their top priority. What is my budget? Is it going to grow? Am I going to be able to compete and do what I need to do to produce an event worth going to? that delights the customer and the sponsor and everybody in between. That was 82% of the concern just two short years ago. New ideas has always been top of mind. Um, so we're very creative people as event industry professionals. Uh, that's not going to change. And if anything, I think we've all gotten a shot in the arm. So the pattern recognition that you and I have around what is the value prop and how do we extend that value prop uh, has now got this new modus operandi, this new necessity that has to be found. And the ROI, not just for the, the event organizer and the property owners, but also for its constituents and stakeholders, um, is going to be needed to be more justified than ever because budgets are likely going to get whacked by, in some cases, 100%, but down significantly to pennies on the dollar, if not dimes on the dollar. So 50% of the concern is, was always sponsorship, 48.4, call it. Um, and so you can kind of see that. But I don't think some of those have changed in the long haul, but I do think that um, – the, the recognition now that survival means I have to innovate is taking number one. So the poll questions are, are here for you to answer. Helps me finish off the back half of this with as much relevance to the audience listening as possible. What has you most concerned? That poll is live right now. If you can answer that one, take a minute or two. Um, what has you most concerned? So will we retain our sponsors is one option. Will we be able to sell tickets to non-live events or virtual only events? It's another option. Will our pre-existing commitments renegotiate on pandemic-related cancellations? This, this happened to me the other day. Um, I was supposed to keynote an event uh, at, at basically my normal asking. Um, had it on a net 30, signed it February 26th. The event reached out to me on March 26th after I had sent a reminder out for the invoice and to check in on them and said, can we talk? And, you know, they had lost $4 million in, in the week prior <clears throat> and uh, from canceled events that they had to do because of the shutdown. And they were worried about 
not only renegotiating those contracts and making up that lost revenue in the short run, but also the uncertainty around fall and some of their Q4 events and whether there would be people at them, whether they'd have sponsors at the same level, uh, whether people would back out. And so, you know, much like everything in the spirit of partnership, um, the, the request was, can we can we work together and see if we can make this up in the future? The answer was yes. And we did that. But again, not alone. Maybe one of your biggest concerns right now is, are your pre-existing commitments going to renegotiate? Maybe your hotel's not letting you out of the contract and, and that's another uh, lawsuit pending or something that you might be worried about. Maybe they are, but maybe your speakers are, are canceling on you and you can't make up new ones. What has you concerned? So I've ran it on that. You've read the answers. I'm going to stop that poll. Um, these just help me and uh, we... We'll move to the next one. So this one is actually just realized that one uh, wasn't live. Apologies for that. So give me a sec second to answer that if you're if you're so inclined. We'll let those run in. And then the second question they'll be showing up soon thereafter is what innovations have you already deployed? Um, listed a couple here that that may be relevant. So I'm going to flip over to that poll, and we'll get the polls out of the way. So uh, that one's now live and. They, they could be that you've already converted to a hybrid or virtual version of an existing event through the fall. Maybe maybe you have to do that because that's where things are. Um, maybe you've repositioned your focus on future events. Uh, so let us know if that's the case or if you're stuck in quicksand trying to survive still. So those are the three options there. Thank you for filling those out. And moving on to the three different futures. So the future mix that, that is pretty apparent for most people, but that we'll dive deep into. And, and then I've taken the value props that exist in generically to sponsors, attendants, and speakers, and I've, I've reordered them in, in how we're thinking about them here. Um, this is debatable still. We're, this is an open conversation, but I think, think these are pretty accurate. So virtual only, uh, these are everything from a free to a premium webinar to a virtual only event where it's heavily on Zoom or Remo or one of these other platforms. Um, and there's not much more to it than that, maybe a little branding. The, the value props that are most delivered in virtual only are the context and then content, especially on the freemium side. Um, the, the community aspect of it is, is probably third, and then ultimately conversion is, is typically fourth on a virtual only event. Now, that doesn't mean you can't focus on the other two up front, but generically across the board, I think that's kind of how the value props lay out. <clears throat> As it relates to live only, these are the things that we all know and love and have gotten used to, context, community, uh, that's the real serendipity, the, the reason, the value prop for why people go, why they're willing to fly across the country or the world, why they're willing to stay a couple days on the road. Um, it has to do with the community, the networking, which ultimately then hopefully leads to conversion in the short or near term, depending on whether there's an expo uh, component or not, or whether it's just general networking and content. Um, and the content is kind of the draw, but it's really the justification. The real draw is who I think is going to be there who I think I might bump, bump into, i.e., can I, can I level up inside of this community for my own personal and professional reasons? So the hybrid event value propositions are still built around community, but I believe and, and would make the case that moving forward, we're going to find more innovative ways than ever to drive true conversion at a really exciting ROI for both ourselves as well as for our, our customers, our sponsors, and, and, and those who underwrite us. <clears throat> so content will play a big role in that in the context will be how defined and how targeted we are moving forward with the nurture streams and the other things post event to keep that community engaged beyond the virtual or four walls of the venue by which we held it. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Community is always number one. Um, I think it'll be more important than ever. Uh, generationally, we'll be grounded in a community above all after this pandemic. It's it's viscerally apparent right now how important community is and how devastating it can be when you don't belong to one. Um, we're missing community in ways that we haven't otherwise ever been forced to think about, and we're excited to get back to it. So those are those are going to be major drivers. They always have been in events, but I think more than ever uh, they're going to be um, demand demand gen uh, related items. Um, virtual booth expos with deeper ROI. We'll talk about that in a second. Lower cost, better targeting, reduced wear and tear, increased productivity. These are benefits from, from I think, the new world of events, um, which ultimately means we'll have better data and more personalization. Uh, virtual gives us the, uh, and, and hybrid gives us the ability to have a broader reach, but within the same category of customer that we care about and that we serve. And 
venues and, and things will be shifted and, and even forced to change or, or studio innovations will become immersive entertainment platforms. Um, and so reallocating budget from uh, things that, that are sunk costs that only exist in the live world, like union dues and um, plugins and Wi-Fi that's overly priced and never works quite as well as we'd like for our event audience. Um, and, and all these different things that are venue specific that suck substantial portions of budget now can be entertaining um, or experience enhancing because we can lever virtual infrastructure and smaller footprints on the physical world uh, to produce a hybrid style event that that delivers even more value and then a lower price um, or cost. So at the end of the day, the data says the priorities haven't changed. Um, this, this kind of shows that again, these numbers are late 2018, so published in 19, but still as relevant as we have anything to look at. Uh, networking is still number one. It's always been the backbone of events. Probably the most um, unanswered question today in how do I go virtual is what will the networking component look like? How will I facilitate the things that only happen in live? How will I facilitate that in a world where we're not next to each other? So there's a lot of innovations and experimentations happening that way. I think that'll be fun to watch. Um, the venue and the multiverse uh this is the multiverse is this world where we live both physical and digital and, and maybe it's built to on a road of virtual events that then lead to some live event that has a premium ticket or a premium offering that is uh you know covid uh free meaning we've checked the box on people's concerns around that whenever the uh, restrictions lift and and as people start to get back to some version of new normal we'll um we'll have these multiverse platforms where there's a live component, there's a, uh, there's a community component, there's an in-person component, but maybe it's spread out through multiple different Zoom rooms, maybe it's spread out through multiple different pieces of uh, technology infrastructure, maybe there is a live um, and hybrid event where there's two audiences and they are interacting both in-person, in-venue, as well as um, through uh, the technology in a virtual way. And so these multiverses are really gonna be the genesis of of taking what is already 80% of the things event planners care about most, i.e. innovative ideas and giving them a platform to and a, and a canvas to paint on. But venue, which has always been 64.7 to 65% of the concern to selecting the right venue, this is going to, I think, become more scalable. The venue will become less of a concern. And so all that mind share and brain power will come back into some of these other areas like marketing and technology and, and how I can um, create social engagement at different levels that are beyond just clicks and likes and reshares. And so um, sucking back some of that, that cognition out of venue selection because we are able to do things in a virtual world off of one platform that, that allow us to create will, um, will give us back some of the mind share of our best people. Here's an example. If you haven't watched this show, you can find it on YouTube. You can find it on LinkedIn Live, Quarantine. Peter Hirschberg, uh, Mickey McManus, a couple of friends of mine started doing this a couple weeks ago. It's a brilliant show. They cover lots of different topics. They bring in some amazing thought leaders. <clears throat> They've started it about seven or eight weeks ago, right in the beginning of this whole thing. This was an episode, episode seven, that I encourage you to watch, but it talked about this multiverse experiment that happened. It was kind of pseudo Burning Man meets um, Zoom meets a bunch of different things. And some of the examples were silent dance floors and, and DJs where there was these different experiences that you could have all on one screen, but you could drill into one from an audio uh, and, and standpoint and yet be in a silent Zoom room in parallel, um, dancing with people as if you were dancing in a real thing, but to the same soundtrack. Um, some pretty cool stuff that was happening. 8-Bit uh, is on the left here, which was same, same kind of multiverse um, experience that happened on one day where uh, people had built an 8-Bit application over top of the Zoom experience where as you got closer in the 8-bit world <clears throat> to each other, you could hear each other and see each other in the Zoom experience. Really innovative things, just the beginning, um, stuff that can blow your mind and, and open up all new possibilities as it relates to how you create that collision effect that only live events in person have been able to deliver so far. So what aspect design interests you the most? Content delivery has been pretty strong, room layout for the other uh, reasons of sponsorship and, and experience and flow. Venue selection obviously had a lot to do with that because you can't lay out a room you don't have a venue for. <clears throat> so I think, you know, when you think about what do you love most about your job, 
it's the curation, it's the creativity, it's the it's the design aspects of how to produce an amazing event experience that meets and hits on all cylinders. And if your mind's not exploding with enthusiasm and excitement as much as maybe fear is set in in the interim about what's possible in this new world, I think hopefully by the end of today, it will. <clears throat> um, so what's dead on arrival? Well, this shouldn't shock anybody. And I, I just got a, a email from Statista with some, some new graphics literally right before this, so I couldn't update the deck. The estimate right now is $500 billion will be lost from the travel and hospitality industry in 2020. Um, but I don't see it coming back anytime soon. <clears throat> and when you look at what people thought in 2018, what are the venues that most uh, most planners are going to work at? These top two <clears throat> are really in trouble because they're fixed, uh, they're less relevant, and they're less versatile than um, – than things that you can do in unusual venues or even outdoor spaces or, or universities or man-made structures that are created almost like a perfect studio and then expanded in some kind of event planner's version of the endless aisle of e-commerce. Um, so <clears throat> I don't see a world where these things come back anytime soon. Maybe it's decades, but that'll have a negative effect on, on a good aspect of our industry in the sense of um, people who've been key partners for ours. And, um, and, and that's, that's unfortunate. And so um, hopefully we'll be finding ways to collaborate or take some of that, uh, those resources and that talent and keep them engaged and keep them in the business through, um, through new, me new methods. And, uh, and so driving conversions back to kind of sponsor side, uh, hybrid events and virtual expo floors um, do things that no expo floor can do and that every attendee that I've ever been to or every business person I've thought, talked to that's been to more than one trade show has said for years, I wish I didn't have to be here. Um, CES, those kind of things where you have to go um, because it's where the entire industry that you rely on is going to go, and it's the one big media platform, um, but where you're also talking about tight, cramped spaces and wayfinding issues and <clears throat> multiple casinos and and trade floors and just meetings that are always running behind or late um, and just the physical wear and tear of concrete floors and carrying bags around and, and getting up and down elevators and stairs and being up all hours of the night. Uh, some of those aspects may be enjoyable for your humans. You know, the connectivity, the party aspect, the dinners, those things aren't going to change. We're always going to crave those. Um, so I'm not one that believes that those things will disappear. But if you look at this stat from uh, West Duck in 2015, 50% of marketers five years ago had attended a hybrid or a virtual event and said more than half of them said that they would be likely to do it again. If you think about five years ago when there was none of these uh, macro factors, we were in a roaring economy and 50% of people were not only open to it, but would do it again. I think you, you saw the need and the demand for more efficiency and for less wear and tear and for better cost of capital. Um, but you just didn't have the pain. You still had a two and a half X uh, across the board revenue generation off of cost spent as an industry globally. So there was still no reason to shift what was already working. Um, and now we're in a world where people not only have become accustomed to it, but they've started to realize that if they can accomplish 90% of this stuff without leaving their office or their house, and they can actually consume maybe more of the content because they're not running between buildings or getting lost or getting sidetracked or they're able to find what they're looking for on the expo floor by clicking around a virtual version that's laid out more thoughtfully and that allows them to get into one-on-one -on -one conversations when they choose to with the salesperson but not be bothered when they're grabbing a Hershey kiss just walking by because they're starving to death. Uh, when you think about those things, you could see how the ROI potential of virtual trade shows and virtual expo floors, even if you have a live event, why not make the trade show floor something virtual as a standard versus the requirement? The booth costs go away, but the possibilities of your virtual booth don't and at a fraction of the cost. And so um, those resources can go back to a lot of other things, including R&D. These have been around for almost 20 years. Some of these companies meet you out of the European Union and, uh, and Six Connects are, are two um, that we've looked at. We'll be using uh, one of those. I won't say who because I don't want to give anybody an unsolicited endorsement. But um, 
these are things that have been around for years and they've always been augmentation. They've done stuff for CE units in the medical space. They've done big brand as SAP, Accenture, these kind of worlds. But you can think about this is this looks pretty hot. You know, if this is what's possible in a virtual world as of the last couple of years, what do you think is going to be possible 12 months from now when these companies now have so much traction they can reinvest in creating new standards of, of virtual delivery that don't require VR goggles? And so, you know, I'm very bullish on um, platforms such as these and, and all the startups and ones that are innovating on different different versions of this. I think there'll be some opportunities to consolidate in this space. But enterprise grade stuff, you want to check out these two platforms as a starting point. There's several out there, but those are ones that I'm familiar with that we've looked at and that we'll be using. So here are my predictions kind of wrapping up, you know, today's um, why the future is bright. You know, the innovation in, in planning has just begun and it is going to be um, a community led effort of some of the best planners, some of the best experience creators in the world now experimenting in virtual the way they were experimenting in where to host it live or venue. Um, ideation. And so um, I'm excited by copying and, and stealing and letting people borrow whatever it is from our events, whatever it is we look at others, because I just think we're going to level up the industry for attendees, sponsors, and speakers in ways that we haven't had to um, in the last decade. Uh, we're going to have to work refining, uh, work faster to redefine the value props. Um, I believe personally that the new standard will become hybrids. I don't think there'll be anything as just live or just virtual. I think the the properties that matter, the ones that, that garner the most interest are going to um, master hybrid events and and the scale and intimacy that they provide in unique ways that nothing else will. Um, we already said good enough is not going to be anymore. Uh, DOA on arrival, hospitality, airlines, convention centers, it's going to take decades to recover, lots of consolidation. Parag Khanna the other day made a great comment, a great futurist, a friend of mine uh, who wrote a book called Connectography that Maybe, maybe this is a chance to repurpose some of these assets because they're not going to be used for events anymore. But maybe some of these hotels that are going to otherwise go bankrupt could be turned into affordable housing um, or homeless shelters and, and things where they could be repurposed and find new monetary value and new um, new ways to add value to the, to the communities they're in instead of just becoming empty shelves. But we're not going to be filling them. I can guarantee you that. Um, and our customers aren't going to be filling them anytime soon. So not for us to worry about. Um, People will travel, but for truly unique experiences, and they're going to be very choosy. Um, I'm going to get on a plane. I can't wait to get on a plane again. I can't wait to go overseas again, but I'm not going for just any event. In 2017, I went to 27 events uh, over 52 weeks, and I think six countries and 13 states or something like that. Uh, and um, I could have literally, in this world, I could have done all but maybe two of those, maybe three all but two or three of those could have been done from my, my home office and would have had no less impact and would have saved me weeks off my life and wear and tear and also thousands of dollars in cost. Um, even though most of them were revenue generating or paid for, there's still the cost associated with being out of the office and, and the incidentals. So um, beat that point to death. But this, this brings into the, the conversation, you know, the different ways that, that speakers will be valued and entertainment budgets may increase. Um, we got into a world over the last decade where it was kind of the, the have or the have nots. You, you spent $100,000 on one speaker because they put butts in seats and everyone else got paid zero, which, you know, years ago used to be maybe three or four keynotes got paid 25K each if they were really worthy. But just the economics didn't work. So you had to go get the big draw. But then every event kind of hired the same people, depending on the industry. And so how do you differentiate on that? And your budgets are going through the roof. And all you're trying to do is, is fill butts and seats uh, to satisfy your sponsor needs. And so, you know, again, kind of tired, kind of over it. Um, less, less interesting than it used to be. But now, what can you do now when you can not require the speaker to leave, but it doesn't feel like a cheap version of their talk? What can you do now when through these platforms you can create um, the keynote into some kind of round table and you can work on speakers and and thought leaders that are willing to get personal and deep dive with people on a more intimate way, not just in front of a general main stage as part of their value prop. And, and oh, they're willing to do it for a fraction of the cost because they don't have to leave two days. And so, you know, they can bang five of these out in a week versus one. And so they make it up on volume. 
so there's there's going to be some interesting models that emerge. Um, speakers are going to be creative in the way that they package themselves. Um, and ultimately, I think the data that you'll be able to collect, the data that will be volunteered uh, in exchange for their tickets, especially if there's discounts involved, will allow you to create more personalized uh, networking, uh, targeted organized serendipity, as I like to call it. It'll be geographically unbounded, and all these things become growth engines. So. Feel free to reach out to me if you want to talk about any of these things or have any questions in particular. Happy to get in a dialogue with you over email or whatever. Thank you again to Smarter B2B and Emerged and some of the platforms here, Six Connects, Meet You, Remo, um, Hacker, Hackathon Producer Tools, we're in the Hackathon space. So we do some stuff there, Discord app. Miro is a really cool new whiteboard extendable technology that's a pretty sick app that we've been experimenting with. Air Meet, similar to Remo. Um, much more on the scale up it can be enterprise but also is much more valuable to even something like a meetup or things like that six connects and meet you would be in the area of you know enterprise level hybrid type events with webcasting and all that stuff uh great data is always available for those who are members of sponsorship a uh, ig sponsorship.com um subscription site uh, have belonged to it in the past they've got great reports and some great thought leadership around how to properly um, package up for sponsors and what sponsors are also most concerned about moving forward. So it's a good source of understanding the needs of the sponsor and, and connecting those needs to how you create your offerings. Um, and I'm Chris J. Snook. It's been a pleasure. We'll talk to you next week.